Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three old school adventures for different systems. Uh, two of them are for old school essentials, one of them is for Shadow Dark. The first one I'm going to be looking through is Tower of the Spectral Sorceress. The second one is Sword of the Dragon Slayer. And the third is the House Under the Moon Dial. These are all really cool adventures. I love them, and I love the aesthetic of each of them. They're really distinct. They stand out from the typical, uh, you know, old school adventure that you read uh, or you see. The art is all really cool and done in a great way. Um, these are fantastic adventures. They're all very different. <laughs> this one is very short. The first one, The Tower of the Spectral Sorceress. It's only 16 pages. This is a level four adventure for Shadow Dark. Um, now. What's funny is I, uh, I have reviewed a couple of these uh, adventures by Gabriel Hernandez, who's the creator of this before, and I was just about to prepare this one when, <laughs> when uh, Gabriel reached out and, offered, and gave me a copy of it. So I hadn't actually purchased it yet. I was about to, and then he, uh, <laughs> and then he offered to uh, just provide it for free for a review. So, uh, you know, thank you, Gabriel, for that. Um, it's a fantastic adventure. It really is. All three of these are great. Uh, so I'll go through it uh, and just show you guys what, you know, what it is and uh, what you can expect in this adventure. The idea, the idea here is that there's this tower on a little island that was the seat of a sorcerer or sorceress, and uh, she had a book club, <laughs> and it, it went very badly, and so all the book club members were turned into ghosts, and they're all dead, and you're here for reasons, right? Maybe you're here because uh, a rival has paid you, or maybe because this is just a random hex and a hex scroll, or you know anything else that you can you can find on the very last page. There's some advice about how to change this and incorporate it. I might have put that at the very beginning, but either way, um, once you've read through the whole thing, then you can see what you need to adjust or customize. So I think it's fan it's totally great. <laughs> really, it's totally great. And the art throughout is, is just delightful. Um, Gabriel has a, a great style. I like it a lot. So you have some random encounters. Uh, and, and what I like is that they're, you know, it's for the whole dungeon, but they're interesting. It's not just a bunch of weird, you know, like, there's a lot of huge table for enemy encounters. You're just going to get one of these four because it's a short adventure and you're, you're not likely to run into the same thing a couple times. But even if you do, it's totally fine. Um, here's the Isle. The Isle of Cosima Fantine, or Cosima. Um, and you have just a few places that you can explore on the outside and then the tower itself. Brief description of each of them. This is for level four, so it's a little harder. You're going to run into things like gargoyles, for example, which are uh, only damaged by magic and... Basically, all the creatures within are greater undead, ghosts, whites, or specters, and so they're they're um, only damaged by silver or magic. And so, if you just have a level one party, level two party, they're probably going to have very little, uh, <laughs> very few means of dealing damage here. So, this is definitely for higher levels. You got to be careful about just throwing this at a at a low level party. It wouldn't really work unless you remove those 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 features. So, you've got some treasure around, and this is definitely one of the motivating factors here. Is going to be treasure. Uh, because you can find little bits of treasure in all of these side places. Not necessarily like... You know, one of the things I like about a short adventure is often having things in the... in the in the sort of the side paths, the side optional places, that will help you with the main path. And that's not necessarily the case here. Like, if you go into the statue garden, there's just gargoyles and some pearls. That's just, you know, going to make you some money. You go into the rose garden, um, you do get some silver dag daggers and a silver scythe. So if you do have players without a lot of weapons or silver, things like that, well, then the garden shed is a good place to go. So that's an exception here. Um, but, like, the rose garden just has a very valuable crystal rose. That's experience points, remember, in Shadow Dark, if you're playing with uh, that means. So if you are, then that's some experience to go get. And that in and of itself is a reward, right? And <laughs> just the experience points. But if you're running this as a one-shot, say, that's not going to be that valuable. So players aren't necessarily going to care about it. So keep that in mind, that if you're running this as a one-shot, you might want to add something in the Rose Garden. Um, well, I mean, the Garden Shed is in the Rose Garden. That might be enough. But you might want to add something in, say, at the uh, in the Statue Garden that would be valuable for the players to go through. Um... There's the Cliffside Vista, and that is something valuable. If you go down to the bottom, there's a dead witch who has an invitation to this place. Uh, a great One of the things I like is that for some of the NPCs here, there's a little, um, you know, text for them to say, my instructions are to guard this door, not to guard this door until I die. Great. Beauregard the butler, who's in love with Cosima. Uh, I love that. And, and he's great because later on you can get to his bedchamber and there's a... Uh, very bad love poetry to her. <laughs> Margins packed with self-criticism. Wow, that uh, <laughs> that's funny. I like that a lot. 
run into some ghosts along the way, you have some riddles you can solve, you have lots of cool magic items, there's a very powerful demon that you can we'll try to help, we'll try to help you, but of course she's a demon, so it's a Marileth who's going to turn on you very quickly if you let her free. Uh, and then you've got the final uh, dungeon room with a lot of, it's a pretty tough fight unless you think of closing this big book. Uh, and then you have the adjustments and customization at the very end. Very simple, very straightforward, uh, but a great little hex to add into any game. Again, this is one of those things where you can put this into a a bigger a bigger hex crawl or something like that, and it would it would just be a great one. You could have rumors about it. You could have reasons to go there, right? Maybe maybe one of your patrons friends was one of the guests, or uh, maybe there's a particular tome in the library of the sorceress that you're supposed to retrieve, or maybe you're trying to get the book itself, the one that was responsible for all this stuff. Really great stuff. Um, I'll put a link below to where you can get it. Great work by Gabriel. I, I like all the, the adventures that I've seen so far from Gabriel. I hope, hope to get more. All right, the next adventure I'm going to cover is Sword of the Dragon Slayer. This one has really evocative art and the use of color. Um, really, really cool. Really, really cool. So this is from the same creator as Tales of the Wolf Guard. Um, Andrea Tupac Molica and Alessandro Paderi, I think. Um, and you can tell, I mean, the design is very, again, that, that bright, really, really bright color that, sh that, that jumps out at you from an otherwise black and white picture. You see that throughout the whole book, and so it's, it's really vivid, and, and it draws you right in. It's a level four to six adventure for old school essentials. And, and what you're going to notice about this one is that it has a, a definite, how to put it, it has a definite vibe uh, that's very old school. Right, your adventurers traveling through the forest. A dragon has been sighted, and it's going to come back. Everyone knows it's going to come back and destroy the town. There's not enough time to get help from the earl or from the baron. There's no time to call other adventurers. Are you going to help? That motivation for a low-level party is probably not sufficient because it's a dragon; they're going to get eaten. But if they're higher level, and this could be level three to level six, that's sort of um, sort of the assumption. There's some advice for the referee. It says if you're level six, it's going to have an easier time. So you could play this adventure as a level six adventure. Level three would be quite hard. I think five, probably level four or five is where you're going to have the best challenge to success chance ratio, especially if you do everything in the adventure. But there's a cool secret here. The idea is that there's this hero who slew a dragon long ago, and now a dragon's back. Where to come from? Is it the same dragon? Is it not? It's not, but the players don't know that. The town doesn't know that. But the secret is that the hero was no hero. Uh, she was a tyrant. She was a ruler of the whole region um, and uh, was, was, you know, horrible. And, uh, but <laughs> there was a, the dragon showed up and there was a battle between tyrants and they both died. And, um, the people were like, all right, fine. She saved us from the dragon. So we'll, we'll let her be buried in kind of a shrine by her followers. And then they, the followers were kicked out and they're like, and we're not going to remember anything else she did. We're just going to say that one thing. And, and now centuries have passed or years have passed 150 years ago. And the people don't know that she was a tyrant anymore because they're all dead, but they were like, yeah, she was this hero, right? Or something? I don't know. And no one really knows why the town doesn't remember her in other ways, but they do remember this story of this hero with a magic sword who killed a dragon. Anyway, they know she, her, her tomb is somewhere nearby, and they know that her magic sword was buried with her. Well, again, it, it's, she's evil, and the sword is this evil sentient artifact, which is really powerful, but very evil. There's a cool time mechanic here, so at certain points and after certain actions, you're supposed to tick... Uh, time marks. It's, it doesn't correspond to actual time passing. It, it relates to like certain events that have happened, or if the players go here a certain number of times, then you tick off a box. Or every time the players rest at the town, you tick off a box. And when enough of those have happened, then events occur in the background. So there's sort of a timer, but it's not uh, just a one-to-one -one, like every 10 minutes or every five minutes or every hour or every day something happens. It's, it's after certain events have been uh, triggered, which is cool because it allows you to sort of um, you know, you can slow it down, you can you can speed it up uh, pretty easily. You can tick a couple, right? Or you could leave off a tick once or twice if you think the players really need some more time. Uh, you have some room there. You get the town with a couple interesting items that you can buy or that you can find, the Hungry Purse. Uh, there's a, a fake roll that you're supposed to do, and the players are supposed to stumble on this as if it were a random encounter, but of course it's not a random encounter. Those sorts of things are funny, you know. I think we all, as DMs, do that at times. GMs do that at times, right? Where we'll like pretend to roll an encounter because we really want the players to roll it. But I've done that before. I tend to do not do that so much anymore. It's interesting that that's kind of a re not a required, but it's just one of the things that happens here. It's definitely a side point. It's just a kind of trick to play on your players. There is an upside to it. Um, it creates a silver piece per day. 
that you do fill it up, but yeah, it's this hungry purse that eats you if you don't keep enough money in it. And players are probably not going to find that. Because again, once they, they're probably not going to have 120 gold pieces in there. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so they're probably not going to find out that magic. Unless they get it, you know, identified or something like that. There's some interesting NPCs and some quests, but the town really is kind of a quest hub. It's, it's, there's not a lot happening there. It's the place where the climax can happen. And there are some NPCs to talk to. There's some places to explore. But it's sort of like, you know, it feels more like a quest hub than, a, than a, an adventuring site or anything like that. Um, you can get some encounters and some, uh, not encounters, excuse me, you can get some like side quests essentially and, and information about quests there. But you also have like the archive, the town archive, and then really encouraged to go there and research and you can find really helpful bits of information. And I like what you can find there. The rumors, sort of, that you find out of that are actually helpful because they reveal the history of the town and they'll tell you more about the stuff that you're about to enter into and so you can uh, be prepared for it. The random encounter tables are also really good in the woods because there's just D4, there's only four of them, there's not a whole lot of bloat here, and they are, um, they're great. They're all very flavorful, they're all very interesting, you don't have, you know, the problem of like a, a curved random encounter table where you're, you're most likely to find the same 2d6 wolves every time, right? You don't have that here. D4, each of them is interesting, um, and you roll until you've encountered them all, and then you stop rolling. Because it's a short adventure, it's actually not that long. There's a few places to find in the wood, these willow groves with some funny role-playing and some funny challenges they can make you do. Mushroom patch with these creatures and a funny old man fight, <laughs> a naked old man who's tripping on the wrong mushrooms, and so you have to protect him. You don't have to, but you can get rewards if you do. And then there's the, you know, some, some hidden paths you can find in the shrine itself, which you don't get the maps until the end of the adventure. It'd be nice to have them earlier, but it's not a big deal, because again, it's a pretty short, pretty short um, little booklet here. You get the shrine and some interesting role-playing here, too, with some uh, magic mouth type things. And then, of course, the the spirit of the tyrant herself is in here. Uh, Krimhild, I think they say it. Krimhild, yeah, something like that. And you can ask her about various things and talk to her. She's not friendly, and if you take her sword from her, she will be very un unhappy. Um, unless you explain what the situation is. So if you know what the dragon is, where it's from, then you can um, you can uh, perhaps get the sword from her without, or get the, the, the puzzle uh, without her flying into a rage, but every question you ask makes her angry, because she's a tyrant. She's unhappy about that. Then you get the Zabras, the sentient sword, which is very evil. It uses the old-school essential rules for sentient weapons. You get this other p potential random encounter, or not random encounter, adventure location with a very powerful uh, item there, which protects you from fire or resists fire, which is really, really good. Um, very, very powerful. <laughs> uh, but if you don't bring the ring back, then you unlock the curse. It decreases your XP by 35%, which is really bad. So um, the very heavily incentivized to get that curse removed or to bring the ring back by the end of the adventure. I love that piece for some reason. I mean, it's kind of cool. We got the, the weird face on its side. Um, I just like it a lot, but uh, it's weird. <laughs> you get the showdown with the dragon, different ways it could happen. The, the dragon stats, which are really strong. Um, and uh, Aftermath, what happens if you succeed, and the different secondary quests you can do, and if the players did them, and, the, and what they get from it. With some cool stuff, here's the time counter that you, you tick down. When it gets all the way down to 12, uh, that's when the town is destroyed. Get some NPCs, monsters, the Wailing Woods, and maps at the end, as well as a random uh, encounter for the wilderness if they want to go out. No. And this one's much more normal in terms of, right, you're doing random cultists, Right, or a hunting pack of werewolves, or an ancient vampire's burial. Um, so there's there's stuff that you can run into out here, and you raise the time counter by two for each of these days. So if you just go off and um, run into, you know, run around the region and start doing stuff, then the dragon's going to get stronger. But what I like about this, of course, is that these have very no relation to the main quest, and it says here that it's up to you to de develop them into spin-offs or hooks for new scenarios. So you could make an entire a region out of the uh, little region map you have here, you could create an entire, um, you know, uh, <laughs> you, could, you could start off the players in Tintern uh, having them doing these other quests and then the dragon appears, right? And then this is a higher level adventure after they've established a sort of friendship with the people in the town and have established this as their home base. You could use those random encounters to create a lot of cool uh, location-based 
um, encounters, right, and, and, and adventures before you have this final climax with Kerrang. So, really cool. There's some handouts, too. I always like handouts. Um, <laughs> that's a really great image there. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, open game license and then the final page. So this is a great adventure. Man, I really like Sword of the Dragon Slayer. It feels very old school, which makes sense for old school essentials. But the art is definitely vivid and modern. It's not like, you know, the, the line and ink art that we often see, but it has a lot of work has been done on this. Um, that, that shock of color in each piece of art is really, it, it appeals to me. I don't think I like it for, like, all of my adventures, but as a very distinct feel, and, and it works for this adventure quite a lot. I love the region, I like the fight, I like the secrets, you can find the random encounter tables are awesome, so yeah, Sword of the Dragon Slayer, highly recommend, again I'll put links below to where you can get it. Alright, the third adventure I'm going to be looking at is The House Under the Moon Dial. This is an OSR adventure for Old School Essentials for character levels 3 through 4. This one's the longest, it's 100 pages, and this one is really cool. It's basically two hex crawls built into one, it does the mirror world thing which, which uh, the Fey world thing, which I love. I love Fey world adventures, and this one is a, a really well executed one. What I gotta say, first of all, is the format of this book is top notch. Now, every page is just covered in stuff, and I like that. It can be a little uh, confusing. Now, what you have is just all this stuff you can see, but uh, I'm not gonna show you guys, but if you click on, yeah, you can see it there. There are hyperlinks to the Old School Essentials Necrotic Gnome website for the core rules, which are free, whenever there is something that can be found in those core rules. So, um, for example, because it's a crab spider, is a creature from the core rules that you can get, I think, for free on their website, you can click on the link and it'll take you right there. And that is true for every single one of these creatures. Now, the other thing is that <laughs> the whenever there's an NPC, uh, they're linked to the page at which their stats or description are found too. Or whenever there's another hex that's described, you can click on that. Or whenever there is at the bottom of the page, you have the entire book laid out, you can click on them and they're hyperlinked and they'll take you right to that section of the book. So this book is incredibly easy to navigate. If you are going past a character and you're like, wait, who is that again? You click on it. Oh, that's right. Not only can you click on the page number or the name, the whole thing is hyperlinked. It tells you where to look for it and it and, and uh, you can click on it and go right there. Now you have to then flip back, but still, it's so useful if at a glance you're running this and you forget something and the players are like, who was this again? You click on it, you're like, oh yeah, uh, oh that's right, it was this guy, right? <laughs> you can make it very, very clear. And the maps are all hyperlinked too. You can click on the locations and it'll take you right to those locations. Incredible, so the, the format of this book is just top of the line. It takes all of that stuff that I've loved about other books you know, in terms of hyperlinking, in terms of clicking and connecting people from different parts of the book to different other parts of the book. And it goes even above and beyond that by linking to the creatures in the Old School Essentials uh, core thing that you can find online. Just awesome. Really, you know, props, hats, hat off to these people for all this stuff. I love the way the maps look too. Really, really flavorful. That's just the first one. Then you have the map of the town. And again, the same thing here. You have the characters and the locations and they're all hyperlinked and you can again click on them on the map too. So just the formatting is incredibly good. And then you get the other side, which is the, um, uh, the uh, you know, fey world here. And I really like the way that it's done with the art that is used in the fey world. Once again, you get these very kind of bright, vivid colors added in, which is very similar to what uh, we saw in sort of the Dragon Slayer. But the, the art is mostly public domain, not all of it, but mostly public domain. And so you get these very, it's like public domain with a twist, kind of verging towards the art punk thing, but not exactly. I love this touch here, where uh, <laughs> the, the, the other side is uh, mirror imaged. Now, the adventure is inspired by a lot of different sources, but as, uh, as uh, the artist or as the, um, the team puts together here, the module is inspired by The Wizard of Oz, Alice in Wonderland, Alice Through the Looking Glass, and Peter Pan. So, really heavily influenced by those sources. If you like those sources, I think that's really, really Cool. Um, yeah, hexanome is the words, layouts of the arts and maps. I'm not sure who hexanome is. <laughs> but then you have the, the different people, the illustrations by Evelyn Moreau, cartography is by Dyson Logos, you have it's edited by Hannah Strang. Uh, I think that's how you say Hannah's name. Um, play tested by Black Donuts. <laughs> and Lenine is featuring Sheldon. And uh, then thanks to Zeb, Yokai Gall, and Sheldon for their feedback. This is so, so good. I love this adventure. So it, it's it's definitely got um, 
this idea of, we've seen it a lot, right? Evil, religious paranoia, um, and the Fae. In this one, it's interesting because basically, as far as I can tell, there's just nobody good. Basically, everybody is awful. <laughs> and so, you know, that's something to keep in mind is some that, 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 that whimsy that you often see with fairy tales and the darkness that goes along with them. This leans into the darkness, I would say, a bit. But there's a, a lot of that whimsy, too. Um, and, you know, again, the content warning here. I, I think that's fair because in this one, you're dealing with children being taken and, and it's... You know, a lot of uh, a lot of people are not okay with that. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm usually not a huge content warning, but I don't really mind them. I mean, I don't really mind whatever the person puts in <laughs> an adventure usually, but I appreciate it when it's here, especially with you know you're dealing with a particular group. So um, totally great to have it there. I love the way that it explains you. Click on the thing, document formatting in the referees toolkit. So how to read this book? Because as you can see, every page is packed full. Every every spread is packed full. Uh, really, really, it is. Great use of public domain art here. And one of the things that you'll see is that the different sections are colored differently. So you have the background stuff is red and the village stuff is, I mean, you just, you, you go through and you get like the color of the book tells you where you are. <laughs> Once you get used to it, it's very, very interesting and easy there. Um, you'll get little like marginal notes. The enemies of the House of Eleven are irrelevant to this module and remain unnamed. Local folklore and the church archives also are prime source of information. So just there's just anywhere that you could have a, uh, a bit of information right is is on here anywhere that you could uh put information that's helpful to the to the referee to the gm it's on here so cool essentially you have this town that used to be uh used to worship this uh fey spirit and then they managed to uh basically trick her or or cut off their connection to her through this trick essentially <laughs> and then um uh as time goes on, those wards start to break. Uh, the 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 cult of that worshipped her starts to disappear. Strangely enough, you know that she's actually pretty wicked. Um, and then these these inquisitors from the church. This guy who was way too extreme for the church got kicked out. And, you know he was he was kicked out here, and now he's going to prove himself. He's going to prove that he's finding witches, and he's going to all this stuff. You have a cheat sheet which takes you a minute just to read. And again, that, that's one of the things that this book has is it, I'm really glad that it has so much formatting, but you do kind of have to work at it to get it at first. Cause it, you know, if you don't have it, there's just, you know, if you, if you try to read this book through like the first time you play it, you're going to get lost. At least I found it. But once you study it a little bit, then these tools start to really become useful. Really, really cool. Meet the Wolves of God led by Cardinal Kramer von Kaltenbach. The Wolves of God arrive at Ramage on foot on day two. PCs close to the church might have heard of Inquisitor Kaltenbach's cruelty. So that's the thing you have to deal with here. Now these, the, the Wolves of God are all werewolves. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, and uh, and you get um, you know, what they're like, what they're doing here, uh, just ways to play them and all this stuff. And then you get the roster of the Wolves of God. Their name, their quirk, and note how, what damage they do and the loot that they have on them. There are 12 of them, or 13 of them if you count. Monsignor Kramer von Kaltenbach. Great piece of art here. Love that piece. Really, really cool. Um, and then you get the adventure timeline. What happens if the PCs do nothing? That's my favorite thing. I love this these sorts of ideas. What happens if the PCs do nothing? I use those in all of my adventures. Whenever it's a longer term adventure, I always put this on there. What happens if the PCs do nothing? Because that will tell you how the adventure will flow, right? And what I like about that too is that it shows you, like if you create that, if you, if you know what will happen if the PCs do nothing, then you can always respond and reform it based on what the PCs do, right? So if the PCs affect something, you can look at the timeline and say, okay, has this been changed by what the PCs have done? If so, well, you know what the goal was because you had the original timeline, so you can adjust it. If it's been completely thrown off, then those people now have a new goal. If it's a new, if it's the same goal is now able to be achieved, but it takes longer or they have to do something different, then you can adjust it that way. So I love these what happens if the PCs do nothing uh, tables. I think they're really, really cool. Really, really great. Um, and timekeeping and travel and how that works. You get the fields and the pastures around the town with the encounters there that you can do. An emaciated talking rabbit caught in a snare. <laughs> I love that. Uh, now, the art of the, N of the NPCs is very different than the art for the the, um, the old public domain art that you might find. And so it can be a bit jarring. Um, 
I like it. I think it's fine. But some people are going to be put off maybe by one style or the other, and they would, you know, we might have preferred the whole. But I think it works totally well. I think it works totally well. Uh, once again, you get the map of the town with everything hyperlinked. So good. And then you get the major locations and the people who are there, uh, as well as how to pronounce their name if you mouse over it, <laughs> if, if their name is particularly difficult or they're an important person. Father R. Fast. Uh, A-E, like cat. It's a diphthong. I think that's what they call that, right? When the two vowels are pushed together into one sound. Um, really cool. Underline names are voting members of the village council. So you, again, you have to check all the little bits of information here because it's packed full. But this adventure packs more into its 100 pages than most other adventures could do in maybe 200. And I think that's really cool. Really, really cool. The <laughs> Cheese Palace. The Blacksmiths of the Farrier. The Miller's Home. The Draper. The Weaver. Healer. Chandler. A lot of these people, I'm not sure the players are going to interact with all of them. They might not interact with hardly any of them. But they might interact with any of them. And so the fact that every one of them has kind of something going on. Now, one of the things cool here is that every time the wolves visit, they can take people away. And then the Moondial curse can affect the children of the household. And so you can click these little boxes and it will check it off for you. So if you're playing totally digitally, you can keep track of things like that as you go through. And that way you don't have to write it all down or use a separate document. You can just click it on here. Really cool. Really cool stuff. Uh, the the uh, St. Elm's Church, which is where the wolves have made their home. Uh, the wicked, oh, sorry, the Wicker Fen, which is the sort of around re around region. And again, you see how the town was blue. The Fen is green, so you know what part of the book you're in. There's some Dyson Logos maps. Essentially, what's happening here is the children are being taken while the wolves are burning townsfolk, and so there's uh, sort of a you know uh, you have to do something about that. <laughs> Uh, preferably you have to do something about both things, right? And, the, and so it shows you kind of the wickedness of both sides because the, the Fae are taking kids um, and the, the townsfolk are burning, every, the, the, the wolves of God are burning everybody. Um, the saint's tomb, the ship in the tree, <laughs> the boy who grew old, Captain Barry. That's a, uh, I think it's Captain Barry, I would imagine you say it, that name. Oh. Byra, never mind. <laughs> Byra, <laughs> Byra. I was totally wrong. I would imagine it was uh, Barry because of um, the guy who uh, wrote Peter Pan. But nope. Uh, you get a really cool uh, moon dial itself, of course, and that takes you down into the other, the upside down. Ooh, creepy, creepy faces, right? Peter, Sa uh, Peter, Sater, lavender twig, the raison d'être, raison d'être. Um, really creepy. St. Elm Unster, the Beatific Knight. He's an undying paladin, champion of St. Ariel, patron of the Noon Sun. He's the one who sort of saved everything. Um, yeah. Or saved it, depending on how you look at it. Uh, you have the... It's just a cool dungeon underneath the moon dial itself. And there's the cool fairy door. Great piece of art for the fairy door. I love that. It's so evocative. You can see exactly what it looks like. <laughs> I would try to show that to my players somehow. And then you get the other side. And this is all in purple. And you get the... Uh, to die will be an awfully big adventure. <laughs> That's from Peter Pan. Uh, you get really cool... Really cool locations here. And they're all very, very much... Uh, in that fey flavor. Uh, ridiculous whimsy and sudden danger and darkness alongside that silliness. Even the vis visceral Viscountess herself um, is really creepy. Clad in virginal white, sp splattered with her, uh, hematic ink blots whose in changing patterns make those adorning insects. On her back sprout self-made wings of found feathers and dead flowers. Her brow is crowned with twisting horns. Her supple neck is too long, like a swan's, like a snake. There are twin tongues in her mouth, a glossy red one that only spells truths, and a sickly white one, like a drowned thing that always utters lies. They call her a Viscountess, Viscountess, but here, her heart is sovereign. Really dang creepy and really cool. That's a great piece of art there, too, with her the rose in her mouth. It reminds me of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. <laughs> Loot me, eat me. <laughs> Things you can find here. Uh, the other side map, the black and white forest, the turnip shore, rabbit wormholes, uh, the unquiet unicorn. <laughs> so good. The moth court, the masked merchants, the weeping merchant, sirens well, sad feast of ravens. 
the white knight, this guy is hilarious. So everything he does is backwards. He sets off in the wrong direction. He attacks with gentle caresses. A kiss becomes a spit in the face. He says the opposite of what he means. And he's distraught, but he acts jolly. He's quite poor at working around the curse. And for example, his energy drain, a successful hit target gains one experience level until they exit the other side. If the new level is superior to the actual level of the character in the mortal world, save versus death. He makes you, uh, he <laughs> gives you levels. <laughs> but then if you leave, you die, or you can die. I love it, his stat block is reversed, the white, or his name, the White Knight. He's lawful, but he's currently chaotic. It's a funny, see things like that, right? Really, really wild and ridiculous. Or the last feast ever. The guests here think that as soon as the, uh, as soon as things are over, as soon as the build, as soon as the, the, the connection is cut, this whole world will disappear. And then there's a note that it says, it won't, they're wrong. Uh, but they, they think the world's ending, so they're just partying and just going, you know, nuts. Uh, <laughs> listening to music, eating, drinking, trying to trying to enjoy themselves at the very last minute of the world. Of course, it's not going to end, but that's how they think. Uh, the Noon Dial, the Captive Witch. Great, great, um, I don't know, just awesome, awesome uh, encounters. Really, really cool. Um, yeah. Uh, lips, tongue, all the parts of her that should be red are rich, of a rich emerald green. So are her irises. She's a shrie shrieking maid of acid jade, viciously assailed by silvery ghosts, fishes, fishes. The blood oozing from their bites, it's liquid gemstones. It coagulates into nail-sized uncut emeralds at her feet. So this is a horrible, uh, uh, you know, torture. And you can end it, of course, and she's connected to the witch in the other world. So this is pretty brutal, right? pretty brutal. It's got that darkness that I talked about before. But man, look at all this stuff you can find, the magic items you can run into, then the open game license and the final. I really like that last page because you see the two sides, the wolves and the queen in there, or the Viscountess in there. Um, they're you know, opposed. But neither of them are very good. <laughs> in fact, neither of them are good at all. Fantastic adventure. The House Under the Moon Dial. I highly recommend you guys check this out. It's so flavorful. If your table is up for this sort of whimsy, man, this is one of the best executions of it that I've seen. It's a different direction to it than Dolmenwood takes. Dolmenwood, I think, has a much more, hmm, I would say, less, more fairy tale, less punk tale, punk fairy tale. Like, this is leaning into, like, the extreme extravagance of the fairy tale it takes the fairy tale as the baseline and then kind of goes beyond it and expands it and twists it a bit. Whereas Dolanwood does sort of much more lean into the uh, the fairy tale as fairy tale qua fairy tale, right? And I think that uh, that's going to appeal to different people. But the it's the same sort of thing. It's in the same genre, perhaps, but they're on different extremes of that genre. I really like the House Under the Moon Dial, though. I'd like to run this at some point. I think it would be great. And with the right table, this would be really, really cool. Really, really cool. So the House Hunt of the Moon Dial, the Sword of the Dragon Slayer, and the Tower of the Spectral Sorceress. All three excellent adventures. I'll put links below to where you can get them. All right, guys, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you in another one.